Welcome to the second part of the lecture for session two. Stories have a set of conventions, or rules as it were. We need to familiarize ourselves with what these are, and then relate them to the branding stories that we tell. So some of these conventions are, first, a central premise. The central premise is the whole point of telling a story in the first place. Basic story premises are things like power corrupts or bad people can be turned good, or saving the world is worth the effort, or even love conquers everything. Premises tend to be easily identifiable, universal human themes. A clean premise is when it's easy to say what a story is about in just a few sentences. When it comes to branding, the premise will always be an aspect of a brand's promise or value. Without a premise, a story just doesn't have a point. The second convention, strong three-dimensional characters. After the premise has been nailed down, the story development process moves to developing strong, engaging, and believable characters who an audience will come to care about, and even root for. In branding, a character can be a literal character that you develop to represent the brand. Think about things like the Pillsbury Doughboy, Ronald McDonald, the Compare the Market Meerkats, the Green Giant, the Michelin Man, and the PG Tips Monkey. Or a character can be a brand's personality, the cheekiness of John Smith Lager, the irreverence of Tango, the elegance of Jaguar, the integrity of the body shop, or the no nonsenseness of the independent newspaper. A third convention is something that I call the confined space. And few things are as confined as 140 characters of a tweet, or the standard 500 to 1,000 words of a blog post, or a sheet of A4 for a press release or three to five minutes of a YouTube video. For a story to have a chance at making a point, it has to eliminate all extraneous details, focus on one point and a character, or a group of characters, who has a good reason for existing. A story that wanders around is aimless or unfolds into a series of unrelated circumstances will only confuse an audience with useless details. The fourth storytelling convention is having a protagonist. Traditionally in storytelling, a protagonist is someone who is on some sort of a quest or undergoes a transformation. The role of the protagonist is to carry the audience through the story, which is why this is the most important character. The protagonist sees more clearly, understands things sooner, makes the good guesses more often, and takes the right path when everyone else says he's crazy. Harrison Ford has made a career out of playing protagonists, characters we, or other characters, initially may not like, but who ultimately changes for the better. Han Solo, Decker from the Blade Runner, Indiana Jones are all classic protagonists. Branding doesn't have this kind of protagonist, in branding, the protagonist is the problem, the need, the requirement or want that your brand promises to solve or satisfy. A brand protagonist, in this light, can either be explicitly or implicitly stated. If brand X wants to convey the convenience of international banking, having branches all around the globe, and stressing this to globe-trotting explorers or business people, the inconvenience of not having such a bank is usually an explicitly stated protagonist. Most service companies explicitly state the protagonist in their stories. Luxury, beauty, and fashion brands typically use an implicitly stated protagonist. Brand X will make you feel youthful. What's implicit is that his audience feels insecure about their gray hairs, or wrinkles, or weight, or whatever it is they feel insecure about. That insecurity is the implicitly stated protagonist. Think of these as the elephant in the room that no one wants to actually say is there. Another story convention is called an antagonist. 
An antagonist is someone bent on stopping the hero or the protagonist of a story. Your antagonists are your main competitors. Few brands actually name their rivals in their stories. However, they're usually clever clues and clues about their identity. At Aardvark, our antagonists, unsurprisingly, were major labels. All we had to say was, we listen and we learn. And our audience knew exactly who we were talking about and how we were different. Another story convention is called an arch. An arch is like a bridge. It gets you from point A to point B. Your story is about fulfilling a need or a problem or a desire. If your brand satisfies a problem, the arch is a person going from having a problem to understanding that your brand will solve that problem. If your brand is fashion related, for instance, the arch is going from not knowing what to wear to the office party to seeing that dress causing a stir. Another arch is someone who is bored of all their video games and thinking that your video game is just what they need to relieve their boredom. Every story needs an arch. Another convention is conflict. Typically a story needs conflict. For branding, I say a story needs resolution. If the arch is the bridge, resolution is the final destination. It's the engagement with the brand, whether that engagement is a purchase or acquisition of cert services. While this isn't a story element, it's the outcome a branding story always aims for. As a set of conventions, each one of these seven has its role to play in conveying relevance and uniqueness to a brand story's audience. So to recap, a story is comprised of seven elements. A central premise, a three-dimensional character, a confined space, a protagonist, an antagonist, an arch, and resolution. We will be exploring these in this lecture as well as the following lectures within this unit. Keeping these seven elements in mind, in this lecture we will be exploring two critical aspects of storytelling, developing an understanding of why storytelling establishes audience connections, and developing an understanding of strategic storytelling elements. In addition to seven storytelling elements, strategic brand stories convey six levels of meaning, and I'll briefly introduce what these are now. The first is the attributes of a brand. In other words, what it is that makes a brand different and unique. The second level of meaning is the benefits of a brand. The third is a brand's values. The fourth is a brand's culture. For instance, Apple has a culture about innovation. Jaguar has a culture of luxury and elegance. Ministry of Sound has a culture of fun and hedonism. The fifth is the personality of a brand. And the sixth level of meaning is understanding its audience through tone of voice, vocabulary, images, music. In other words, all of the things that a brand story uses to convey meaning. So let's spend some time exploring brand attributes. Brand attributes address specific aspects of a brand. In other words, they signify the basic nature of a brand. They are a bundle of features that highlight the physical and personality aspects of a brand. Attributes are developed through images, actions, or presumptions. They are a collection of characteristics, personality, elements, and associations that make a brand uniquely yours. Boiled down, it's what you bring to the table that no one else can. Attributes convey uniqueness. Attributes convey uniqueness and distinctiveness. 
Attributes can also convey a brand's value and its promise. Understanding your brand's attributes helps you define the confined space your story must work within. You can think of this element as a filter, filtering out everything that is extraneous to your brand story to keep it on point. You can also think of it as a boundary or a frame for a conversation, keeping your basic story focused and concise. Within a brand story, attributes will always be the central premise. Specific attributes can also be the three-dimensional character, or sometimes even the protagonist. Which one it is will depend on the story you want to tell and that story's point. The attribute you wish to tell a story about may also influence how you want to tell that story. In other words, determine whether your confined space will be a short video, a blog post, a press release, an image, or some other form of communication with your audience. Understanding your brand's unique combination of attributes helps you establish and convey the following things. Your difference. The clarity of the message you want to deliver through your brand story. The perception an audience has of your brand this perception should be heightened and strengthened by every brand story you tell or brand experience that you share. Two-way loyalty. Your end of the bargain is not wasting your audience's time. Each and every story you tell or experience you share has to be meaningful and relevant to your audience. Your loyalty to your audience should, in the medium to long term, result in your audience being loyal to your brand. To illustrate the point about brand difference, on the screen are two very popular brands of coffee. Keeping the concept of difference in mind, they are, at the end of the day, both just cups of coffee. In your opinion, what makes one different from the other? What association do you have for each one of them? Think about the brand messages and their advertising. Which one do you listen to, and why? How does the branding messages for each influence you? Do, they, do their messages influence you? Spend a little bit of time thinking about this. Pause the video here if you want to spend a few minutes just thinking about the, your answers to these questions. You'll be answering similar questions to, to these in the scenario and the template exercises that accompany this session. Brand benefits are about what it is your brand does. If a brand exists to solve a problem, then how exactly does it solve that problem in a way that no other brand can? If it exists to fill a void or a need or a desire, then how does it fill this in a way that a similar brand can't? What positive experience, action, or outcome can your brand provide? This is another aspect that relates to the central premise part of a story. It is also the arch that leads to a resolution. Brand values explain how you can prove what you can do and why you can do it better than your competitors. Without a unique value proposition, your brand lacks focus and leaves an audience confused. The more value that your brand brings to the market and to an audience, the stronger your brand can be. This needs to be something beyond a profit motive. Why are you passionate about what it is that you do? Brand values relates to the protagonist element of your storytelling. Remember, in branding, the protagonist is the problem, the need, requirement, or want that your brand promises to solve or satisfy. Solving or fulfilling is its function and its value. To get to the root of your brand's value, ask yourself these following questions. Who are we? What do we stand for? What do we do for our audience? How does our audience see our brand? And what do they think it stands for? Now enter your story's protagonist, who solely exists to answer just these questions. The central premise of your story solely exists to allow the protagonist to answer a specific question. 
The penny has probably started to drop while this approach is more powerful, more effective, than merely bombarding people with just those standard, buy this message. And why we're spending so much time in the first in this first lecture for this session covering story t storytelling. Hopefully you've begun to see the relevance between the seven storytelling conventions, brand attributes, and how strategically produced brand stories can use these to create associations about a brand that links to memory. If not, don't worry, this, this is a theme that we'll be developing far more fully over the next couple of slides. So what is this thing we call brand culture? Let me spend a little time answering that by outlining what creating a brand culture actually accomplishes. A brand culture creates a sense of community with its audience. It's the shared aspect of storytelling and all of the elements that go with that story. Each element speaks about your brand. They create associations that should mean something and stand for something. It's the act of sharing, whether it's experiences, knowledge, time, advice, ideals, beliefs, or things. All of this creates a culture or an environment. A brand culture creates an experience with its audience. It's actually audience focused. It develops a sense of empathy. A brand lets its audience know that it understands what it is they want, need, or requires. A brand culture also defines your brand's ethos. It is the proof that you walk the talk. It's the proof that your motivation isn't all about the money, that there is a genuine passion on your part for doing whatever it is that you do. This aspect links to your story's central premise. It can also be your story's protagonist and also its character, which one will again depend on the story that you want to tell and the reason why you want to tell it. Okay, so what's brand personality all about then? Brand personality is, it's a set of human characteristics and attributes that are attributed to a brand name. It's something to which an audience can relate to at an emotional level. And this is the added value that a brand gains apart from its functional benefits. Think again back to that Dyson uh, example that I gave. Just like any other Hoover, but when you really start drilling down into it, it's all about the lifestyle and actually not just owning a Dyson, but having a Dyson home. Brand personality is 100% about the three-dimensional character aspect of your storytelling. This is something we'll be discussing in greater detail over the next few slides. Why is having a brand personality important? It's about establishing a perceptive difference in uniqueness. Using personality archetypes gives your brand a personality and a story that everyone can understand and relate to, both internally and externally to your business or your service. Artvark Records' personality was kind of like the cooler older brother or sister you wanted to be when you grew, when you grew older. Or a cool older cousin, or a hip uncle. Most families have one of these. Their tastes are a bit ahead of the times, but they're unquestioned. When they speak, everyone listens to what they have to say. They don't follow trends, they make the trends. They have that undefinable and unquantifiable it or X factor. And yet they remain very grounded and very down to earth. They're not arrogant, which kind of makes them even cooler. They also like to share. It was the right character for the company and one that worked and still works incredibly well. Once established, it was a brand personality that worked across cultures and geographies. That cool family member personality is universal. Considering the more majority of record labels don't even have a brand personality, the fact that Aardvark had one, much less one that worked incredibly well, made the label stand out in a very positive way even more. It was no accident that the label attracts the audience that it does. We were very clear about who we were as a brand, what we had to offer, and why we were passionate about the business that we were in. Our brand stories and character clearly delivered the message. 
There are five basic dimensions of brand personality, which you can see here on the screen. And I apologize, again, this is part of the reason why I've split this overall lecture into two halves. I'm hitting you with rather a lot in this one. So between you know seven uh, storytelling elements, six levels of meaning, now we have five personality dimensions. <clears throat> in the table, you'll see a dimension name like sincerity and the traits that are most often associated with that dimension. In the case of sincerity, the traits most often associated with sincerity are domesticity, honesty, genuineness, and cheerfulness. This is an area that has undergone extensive research for decades, hence the identified traits associated, associated with each one of these five dimensions. You are, quite literally, looking at the results of hundreds of millions of pounds worth of marketing research. Why all of this money and interest spent on brand personality? People make purchasing decisions based on any number of associations they have with an individual brand. And companies spend millions on advertising and marketing activities so that they can influence what those associations might be. Just as we each choose our friends based on their personalities, brands can elicit the same sort of response in consumers. Understanding your brand's personality will transform how you approach an audience. It's also one of the fundamental foundations of creating a branding community. Let's look at the first dimension, sincerity. Consumers interpret sincere brands as being down-to-earth, honest, wholesome, and cheerful. So using, I don't know, Julia Roberts as an example of an actor or actress brand that has sincerity associated with it, sure, some people will find Julia Roberts annoying, but most people find her endearing, the kind of woman you could sit down with for a chin mic at the kitchen table. Next up is excitement. The most exciting brands are daring, spirited, imaginative, and on the cutting edge of things. Not only are Burton snowboards on the cutting edge of technology and performance, the products bearing the Burton names are designed with their audience in mind. Funky graphics and forward-thinking designs make Burton a leader in their competitive industry. Next up is competence. Reliability, intelligence, and success are the traits best associated with brands associated with competence. Even in these trying economic times, there are a few financial service firms that still manage to play well in, in an audience's mind. Ernst & Young is the stable, successful, smart guy next door who can tell you how to transform your business. Sorry for the sirens, it's just proving to be one of those days, really. Next up, we have sophistication. A brand that is sophisticated is viewed as charming and fit for the upper classes. When it comes to esteem and seemingly eternal longevity, the Chanel brand is unequaled. In good times and bad, this brand remains strong as a symbol of life lived in all the right places, doing all the right things. Last, we have ruggedness. Interestingly, an audience picks up on this personality dimension quite well. Rugged brands are seen as outdoorsy and tough. The North Face has built an empire by outfitting people who actually do quite scary things outdoors, um, as well as those who just want to look good. Now, in most cases, a brand only has one dimension. There are others, like Aardvark, who have more than one, and I'll explain how this works. Overall, Aardvark mixed sincerity with excitement. Both of these dimensions captured its brand personality. Now, where things get a bit tricky was defining a dimension for Aardvark's different audiences. Aardvark not only releases albums within staggeringly different music genres, it sells music to the public and to other companies. So taking the first part of that first, selling music to the public. We couldn't brand our alternative rock releases the same way that we branded our minimalist electronica releases. It just wouldn't work. Alternative rockers wanted ruggedness and excitement. Minimalist electronica lovers wanted sincerity and sophistication with a dash of competence. 
We reflected each tribe's dimension preferences and all of our branding messages to each, all the while making sure the overall look, feel, and style were congruent to the overall Aardvark brand. In other words, we played with various aspects of the overall brand character and personality and tailored each to every genre of music that we released. The fun was in developing an overall brand personality and character, an umbrella or master personality as it were, that could enable us to do all of this. An additional layer of complication was licensing and selling our music to st strategic business partners. Partnership deals with international music download providers, other record labels, other music publishers, um, and people who rented our music for television, film, and gaming, uh, game production companies, was a large part of the overall business. And it would have been really inappropriate to send another business the same kind of branding stories or have the same kind of branding character as those that we sent to the public. When it came to our business partners, competence was the defining personality dimension with a dash of excitement and sincerity. And if this sounds like having multiple personalities, it kind of is. Most entertainment companies do have multiple faces. We have to. It's all about understanding the wants and needs of the various tribes who make up our overall audience and what's meaningful and relevant to each one of them. If you go on to own or handle a company that only requires one dimension, be very, very thankful and be very, very grateful. The point of the Aardvark example is this. Understanding these characteristics for your brand, but more specifically your audience, supports you in framing your strategic branding storytelling. Okay, so what is brand audience? You've already done a bit of reading about this, and you've heard it in one or two of the videos that you viewed already. An audience is what we used to refer to as consumers or customers. An audience is also composed of distinct individual tribes, what we used to refer to as demographics. Traditional marketers still use the terms consumers, customers, and demographics. I don't. And kind of a lot of the kind of newer generation of marketers, they don't either. I said, I'm not alone. More and more marketing people have begun abandoning those old fashioned terms for audience and tribes. So why would we do that? Terms like consumer, customer, and demographics dehumanize people. They turn living people into an abstraction, an other, that is reduced to statistics or a percentage point. They're not us. We can do horrible things to them, like spamming and direct mail, because we no longer see them as being human, like us. Consumers, customer, and demographics. Traditional marketers see them as just the life support systems for wallets, purses, or checking accounts. That's all they're worth. Audience and tribes is an affirmative view. People who think in these terms want to exchange experiences, and yes, goods, products, and services as, as well, but we want, we want to do these things in a more positive way, a way that isn't reductionist. We see audiences and tribes as humans. They're one of us. They have thoughts and feelings and opinions and aspirations, as well as wallets, purses, and checking accounts. While they may all sound slightly hippy-dippy, a way to you know, approach this kind of work, the rewards, on many different levels, makes the effort worth it. Audiences are loyal. Audiences can also advocate on your brand's behalf. Numbers and statistics can't advocate, and they never will. Before listening to this last part of the lecture, I suggest that you refer back to your notes about the seven elements of a story, which just as a reminder, the central premise, the three-dimensional character, the confined space, the protagonist, the antagonist, the arch, and the resolution, and really understand what each one of these elements are and what they contribute to a story. 
I'd also suggest revisiting your notes about the six levels of meaning, which, just in case you've forgotten, are brand attributes, brand benefits, brand values, brand culture, brand personality, and audience. Understand the relationships and interactions between the seven story elements and six levels of meaning. You will need to relate what you learned in the first half of this lesson to the last bit of brand storytelling that we're about to cover here. We, we will be building on that knowledge, which you will need in order to complete the scenario and the template exercises for this session. A good strategic brand story is also measurable. In other words, your brand story is the most important statement you can make. To ensure it's as powerful as it can be, document your story and ask these three questions. Number one, is it relevant? By relevant, I mean you can state what you think is important, but the only thing that matters is that it's important to your audience. Make sure your language feels like it belongs to them. Second question, is it valuable? By valuable, I mean, does your brand story deliver real value to the lives of your audience? If it isn't immediately evident, go back and craft the statement so it delivers the value. Third question, is it extendable? And by extend extendable, I mean, can your brand story extend across your entire offering? Can it grow with you into the future? Make sure that your story has enough depth. And again, think about the example that I gave for that umbrella personality for Aardvark. That's a good example of making something extendable. Here I'm going to give you some storytelling secrets. Have you ever read a corporate website that's so dry and so factual it nearly puts you to sleep? Conversely, have you read a, one of those About Us page that was so painstakingly detailed? You know, the ones that kind of say, it started when I was born in a small town, in college I studied, then 10 years after that project we decided to, and it just goes on and on and on in minute detail. So much so that you're utterly confused by the second paragraph. Another thing to keep in mind, that's basically, don't do that. Keep things nice, clean, and streamlined. Another secret to story writing. Have you accomplished something unimaginable? Overcome an impossible hardship? Overjoyed to find your passion? Tell your audience about it. These are evergreen ideas and emotions that will always resonate with your audience. It shows you're genuine, and it shows it, again, beyond a profit motive. You have a real passion for doing the thing that it is that you do. Challenge yourself to tell your anecdotes in two or three sentences to stay on course. This is a topic we'll be going into far, far more in depth on the whole kind of writing more effectively online course. But for now, just kind of think about how you can put things in a very, very succinct way. Some more storytelling secrets. If your new customer or new client met you in person after reading your website or blog, would there be a big disconnect between that and your real personality? Showcase your personality and unique style by telling your story in your own voice. Giving your audience a glimpse into the kind of person or brand that you are, this, should, this will always show you and demonstrate your passion. And the next one, stumped on how to embrace your voice on paper? Risk looking like a crazy person and actually say out loud the story you want to tell online. Even record it with your smartphone or one of those dictaphones. Transcribe it and then edit it just to round out the edges and um, make sure that everything is smooth. If you sell clothing that's primarily aimed towards professional 20-something women, why not think about creating a blog, or a blog series at least, that offers fashion advice and tips for dressing well at work, or outfits that take you from the desk to drinks afterwards. You get the idea, those kind of stories. 
Tell the stories your audience want and need to hear. Another little tip is um, devote 30 minutes to getting to know your audience better. What are they reading? What do they comment most on? What are their biggest challenges? Craft blog posts addressing what you've learned. And in doing so, remember the personality dimensions, but also remember the six levels of meaning. Brand attributes, benefits, values, culture, personality, and audience. That wraps things up for this lecture. I wish you all the best for your work on the scenarios and the template that accompany this session, and I will see you in the next session.